online. Uh, so, you know, we've got a lot of uh, really great talks planned for today. But uh, to start us off, we're really happy to have uh, Kalisha Bullard, who's going to be telling us about, uh, you know, her work on communication in multi-agent RL. So I'll let you take it away. All right. Uh, oh, thanks, Dylan. Um, so I'm Kalisha Bullard. I am a research scientist at DeepMind on the game theory and multi-agent team. I recently started at DeepMind in December. Um, so this work is actually from my postdoc at Facebook AI Research. Um, so yeah. And so I'm going to be discussing some uh, work that we did on zero shot communication. Um, and, uh, and I'll also at the end kind of uh, present some open problems and give a bit of a hint of kind of what I'm thinking about now. Um, so in general, I'm quite interested in cooperative multi-agent systems. Uh, I think that the world is mo inherently multi-agent, which I feel like I don't have to convince you guys about. And of course, here are a couple of biological examples. Um, and I think that uh, when we think about cooperation, particularly because we're thinking about ways in which we can deploy, you know, technologies to human environments, then it's going to be necessary to have communication and coordination for human AI coexistence. And so um, my background is, is quite different from many of the speakers that we've seen so far. So I'm not coming from the, the theory background. Actually, in my PhD, I focused on robots learning from humans. And then in my postdoc, I started looking at multi-agent learning. Uh, so my work is largely motivated by these types of domains. Um, so I think some of the most relevant application domains when you think about human AI coexistence um, and or just like AI agents um, coordinating and communicating with each other, you know, self-driving vehicles are commonly used to motivate this robots in human environments like these robots in a factory. Um, and so these are kind of the ones that are going to be the most re relevant high level domains. And to be fair, this talk will be quite abstract, but it's uh, on a high level motivated by these kinds of domains where you might want agents communicating with other agents. So imagine that you had all of these embodied agents existing, operating in some shared environment, so this autonomous vehicle ecosystem. And there's a question about how can one learn to communicate? How can the agents learn to communicate to aid in coordination? Uh, so you might think, well, what about supervised learning from data sets or Im imitation learning from demonstrations? But one challenge is that um, for supervised learning, particularly because here you have different agent embodiments, you need um, huge existing data sets for each of the embodiments and also for each of the different things that you want to communicate. Um, so this becomes... Uh, a really expensive way to try to, to solve the problem, although I do think that, the, that it could complement uh, reinforcement learning. But multi-agent reinforcement learning provides a way for agents to learn through you know, self-play or agent-agent or interactions. Um, but then there's this question of, should agents have to train with every potential partner to infer a general communication protocol? And what I mean, when I say general here, what I mean is to be able to generalize to other agents. So for example, I'm a car agent and I learn with another agent. If I see a new car, I wanna be able to you know, talk to it quickly. Um, and so this is motivated by this idea that like we want agents to learn protocols that will generalize to unseen partners or this work is. Um, so this work was, again, it was, so it was done at, well, what's now Meta AI. I, ironically, um, three of the five people who were, we were all there at the time, but three of the five people are no longer there. Um, and then uh, Jacob was my uh, primary collaborator on this work. Um, so we're looking at the emergence of zero shot communication protocols. Um, and so the motivating research question here is it's motivated by this idea that, my, so again, I came from, in my, my PhD, I was thinking about robot, robots learning from humans. And so coming into the postdoc, that was the context that I had been, you know, had been very familiar with. And uh, there was this interesting question around, you know, enabling agents to communicate through action, which is what you might expect for embodied agents. Um, independent of what their embodiment is. And this is something that humans do. So even if you think about embodied agents that want to communicate in a way that humans can interpret, this is useful. Um, all right, so that's the motivating research question. Uh, and then first, a bit of background. So first, learning a communication protocol. So let's say you have a population of these three agents, so red, blue, and an orange, and they have some set of communicative goals that they've been given. Um, so what we want is for each agent in the population to learn to generate messages for every communicative goal in the library that's been given to them. Uh, and so the learning problem is for every agent to learn a policy mapping the set of communicative goals to the message space. 
Um, okay, so this is basically a type of, uh, so this is basically done through signaling games. And in the uh, multi-agent communication literature, people typically talk about referential games. So I'll use those interchangeably here. Um, so the premise of the game is that you have a sender agent that is given some referent or a communicative goal, and it needs to generate a message for that. And the receiver agent must infer what, um, what communicative goal is being signaled. So input would be some goal G, Alice sends a message M, uh, Bob makes a prediction about what goal Alice was trying to communicate. And then the loss is some distance between the two. Um, so important assumptions for this typical problem setting of this referential game is that it's a discrete communication channel, uh, which means that um, typically each message is an individual action, although in more recent work people have started looking at some sequence of symbols, um, but that exponentially increases the size of the message space. Um, and and uh, the, uh, the cheap talk setting where there's no cost to actually taking action. Um, so this is just kind of a, a visual sample of some of the recent prior work in multi-agent communication in the deep learning era. It's not intended to be exhaustive, but to briefly illustrate. Um, and so these are the important assumptions that we relax in this work. Uh, I, uh, given that the audience here has been quite uh, theoretical, I decided to focus on the, the top one. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the bottom one, which is the relaxing the assumption of cheap talk and thinking about costly messages. But I'm happy to talk about the, the work in continuous uh, settings offline. <laughs> um, okay, so the problem formalism is this is a fully cooperative uh, problem setting. So we make the assumption that communicative goals are given ahead of time and the protocol is supposed to emerge. Um, so there's no data or supervisory signal given. Uh, and so this is formalized as a, as a decentralized partially observable Markov precision process, a DEC -POM dp um, and so the standard definition of DEC -POM dps you have N agents, in our case, N will be two, a sender and a receiver, um, some finite set of states, a set of joint observations uh, is, is generally defined, but each agent can have private individual observations. Um, there's going to be a set of joint actions as, as typical, and in this work, all the actions are actually communication actions. Um, and then the, the, the reward here is a shared reward, a team reward. And then we also add this set of goals. Um, so you can think about it as like a goal conditioned deck POM DP. Um, and so visually, effectively, you have these two learning agents and there's gonna be a set of observations that they can observe from the world. Of course, the environment, the dynamics are non-stationary because the agents are co-learning. Um, and then agent, J, agent I can observe agent J's action and vice versa. Um, and then the goal is to maximize the total shared return per episode. So, um, so we, we do a typical um, training regime for uh, cooperative settings, so centralized training, decentralized execution. So agents can share information in, at training time, back propagate signal, et cetera. But, um, but at, at test time or at inference time, agents are expected to make decisions using their individual policy. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about, give context about the zero shot coordination problem setting, and then talk about the, the, the problem setting we, or the variant of this, or the instance of this we introduced, which is zero shot communication. So um, zero shot coordination was, um, was introduced at, uh, in 2020, and this was also work done at the time Facebook AI research. Um, and basically the problem setting is such that it, it's, th it's this fully cooperative problem setting and agents uh, must coordinate at test time with other agents who have been independently trained. So effectively at test time, you're gonna see um, a novel partner. Um, in this work, they introduced equivalence mappings or symmetries of, of, of policies, which are bijective mappings, which I'll go into more depth about in the talk. And also they formalize symmetries for each element of the underlying uh, DEC POM DP. Um, so we're going to build upon this work. So um, in our work, we formalize the problem setting of zero shot communication, which is an instance of the zero shot coordination setting where the goal is to learn a communication protocol that effectively generalizes to unseen agents. So agents are uh, trained in self-play. So, um, Say So I'm going to describe the green, these are two different pairs of self-play agents, a green and a blue pair. I'll uh, describe the green pair. So let's call our sender agent pi one always. 
and um, pi one is given some goal G and it can take a private observation O1 and they can also take an action A. Let's call our receiver agent pi two. Pi two can observe action A taken by uh, pi one, it gets its own private observation, and then it makes a prediction about um, the, the goal being communicated. So this is just the, the signaling game. So at test time, um, in order to evaluate zero shot communication, what we do is effectively swap the agent. So every, pair, every sender will be uh, paired with um, every receiver that it's not seen before and vice versa. And so uh, this is zero shot because this is a, an agent that trained independently from you. So you might say, okay, well, this sounds you know, very reasonable. What's the problem with just training using self-play? So the problem is that self-play has many equivalent but incompatible joint policies um, or in our communication protocol is a joint policy. And successful coordination means agreeing on a protocol, which means converging on the same optimum. So let's say that this is, this is some simplified um, optimization landscape. Say each of these um, uh, red dots represents um, a communication protocol, an optimal communication protocol. So you can imagine um, that one is, you know, one of these is German, one is French, one is English. Naturally, they're not that far apart, but just so you get the, the idea, the intuition. Um, if you have agents, um, send a receiver agents training completely independently of one another, there's no reason to believe a priori that they'll converge on the same optimum, right? And so what we want to do is effectively bias the optimization landscape such that if a send a receiver um, agents train separately, uh, train independently, given that they will initialize in different parts of the space, that they still, given uh, an optimization algorithm that is effective, they still will converge on the globally optimal solution. There's only one globally optimal protocol. Yes. Uh, quick clarification question. On the previous slide, what's the um, role of the additional observation? Um, if all, all you're trying to do is communicate the goal, um, or what would the observation be in practice? That's a good question. That's really just the formalism. Uh, okay. So in this matrix slide game that we're going to talk about, uh, there's not really one. But actually, in our continuous experiments, uh, where we have like a, a like a simulated arm, then it could observe um, the actual uh, X, Y, Z roll pitch y'all of each of the joints. Okay. For example. Yeah. Um, okay. So, all right, so our general approach is to induce bias with priors in the solution space. And we wanna use real world um, constraints to engender this uh, globally um, optimal protocol. So we don't want it to be just arbitrary. And, um, and then we want to, then the other thing is to adapt the learning objective to learn some distribution over equivalent global optima. So we're gonna exploit this idea of equivalence classes or symmetries in order to um, uh, infer what the equivalent global optima are. So um, prior to the real world setting. So the first thing is, since this is inspired by agents that are communicating through physical action um, or through action in general, action costs there's in, in terms of energy, right? So there's a cost, th this is a no longer a cheap talk setting, communication is costly. There's a cost to actually having to exert energy to take action. And the other um, is that there's a non-uniform non -uniform distribution over the different communicative goals. So um, it, it's pretty uh, common in the quantitative linguistics literature to use the Ziffian distribution over uh, words or sentences. It, it's been um, seen to be um, useful for like uh, human behavior. And so we use this to induce a non-uniform distribution over the communicative goals. So when you put these two together, what this incentivizes is a minimal effort protocol, because effectively what you want is um, in uh, goals that occur more frequently with a higher probability, you want them to be mapped to actions that have a lower cost or energy. Um, and so overall, what you get is minimizing effort in your, in your protocol. Now, this picture that I'm showing you, um, you know, uh, implies that there should be one globally optimal um, one globally optimal protocol given this. Uh, so actually, okay, I'm just gonna skip this slide. So, um, but what about if you have symmetries in realistic communication? So now let's say I am this, um, this uh, car agent and I wanna tell another car to go ahead. And there may be three um, you know, uh, ways of doing this that use the same amount of energy. So I could weigh with my left hand, to say, come, it's your turn. I could wait with my right hand to say, come, it's your turn. Or I could do like a head nod to say, like, you go. Um, 
So effectively, in a very, if, if this were your only communicative goal, these will be three simple protocols that are all different protocols. And the challenge is that um, these are equivalent minimal effort protocols, but they're incompatible. So um, if I'm a if I'm a receiver that trained with a sender that weighed with his left hand uh, at test time, when I face off a sender that is like nodding, I'm going to have difficulty. We're going to have a communication failure because I we didn't learn compatible policies. So how does this impact the optimization landscape? So the, the, the nice picture I showed you with one global optimum is going to be the case if you have no redundancy in the action or goal space. So every action has a distinct cause, every goal has a distinct likelihood. There's only one way to map actions to goals to minimize effort. But if you have any redundancy, so many different actions have the same cost, um, which is like different actions exerting the same amount of energy or many different goals have the same likelihood, then there are multiple ways to map uh, to basically do a mapping that is minimal effort. Um, and we'll focus on action symmetry in this work. Okay, so now I'll go back to the picture that I kind of skipped. Um, oh, that's unfortunate, it cuts off. Okay, so um, on the left, if you're in the okay, okay, <laughs> okay, nice. Okay, so on the so the um, the left the left column is a this is a visual visualization of a joint of two different joint policies for an orange pair of uh, orange sender receiver pair and a green sender receiver pair. So I'm going to go through each column. So the left column is a visualization of the sender policy. The middle column is a visualization of the receiver policy, and the right column is a visualization of the um, uh, the confusion matrix where sender receiver agree. Um, or, you know, okay, so um, on the left side, on the left column, if you look at the vertical axis, this represents the input for the sender. So it is actually um, different communicative goals. So there's like zero through four. So there's five different communicative goals. Um, and the X axis is actions. So there's, I think, 15 different actions shown here. Um, the receiver column, uh, the the vertical axis is input again. So that's different actions that it could see by the sender. And then the um, horizontal axis is outputs so of different uh, goals that it could uh, predict. And then the right side again is where sender and receiver, um, the joint probability. So effectively what we wanna see is probability mass along the diagonal because it means that sender and receiver agree. Um, so the other thing here to note is that um, in this left column, the uh, the the intents are ordered by frequency. So the lower rank, the more probable or more frequent that intent occurs. So that's what that line is supposed to show you. And then the actions are ordered by cost. So as you go to the right, the actions are more costly. And you see these E equals um, classes. These are supposed to be like energy classes, basically. So actions that are grouped together. So there's only one action that exerts zero energy and it's action zero. And then you see um, there's four or, four or five different actions that exert energy one, et cetera. All right, so basically there are, these are both optimal joint policies um, if you are training using self-play because um, each of them is going to map intent one, which is the most, or the intent zero, which is the most frequently occurring intent to the action that exerts no energy. There's only one way to map that, but then there are four different ways that, um, there are four different actions that you can map for any of the intents zero through four. Right, and you still get a minimal effort policy because all of those actions exert the same amount of energy. So they're effectively symmetric. They're, you know, any permutation of them is still a minimal effort protocol. So in self-play, the agents do very well, but even in this simple game, you see that um, for zero shot coordination and cross play, they only get around 45%. And it turns out that um, intent zero, the, the most frequently occurring one occurs about 44% of the time. So basically the best they can do is always guessing the most frequently occurring intent. Um, because again, the, any permutation of the other four actions is still going to be optimal from a self-play perspective. So how do we address this gap in communication efficacy between training partners and novel partners is the question. All right, so we introduce a method. Um, so if you do training during self-play again, just like I said, um, here's the, the self-play objective where um, you're trying to uh, maximize, you know, some objective or um, you're trying to learn some maximal joint policy and it will converge effectively deterministic uh, in terms of like converging on one of these policies, right? So or one of these joint policies, putting all the probability mass on one protocol. And so the problem of course, is if my partner converged on a different protocol, we have communication failure. 
Um, so this is where we, so other, so this, the, the work that I talked about, we are building upon this um, work, um, other play that introduced this, the zero shot coordination problem setting also introduced um, uh, a modification to the self play objective, such that now it's actually going to maximize over um, equivalences over policies. So uh, basically, if I'm Pi one, I'm not only learning, I'm not learning a, a policy that only is going to be optimal with respect to my training partner, it should be optimal also with respect to any symmetry equivalent policies. Um, so it's going to learn some, uh, some mapping between uh, Pi one and a distribution over all symmetry equivalent policies for Pi two. So it maximizes over equivalence classes. Um, classes are exogenously determined at that time or yes yeah, so in this well okay so the equivalence classes come from the environment from, from some grounding in the environment so like in my example of like the waving phys, from a physics perspective i use the same amount of energy if i wave on my right versus my left hand and so this work the other play will assume that those are given um and so the the contribution here what I'll talk about quasi equivalence discoveries discovering those those symmetries but it is the case that the symmetries come from just grounding in the environment, yeah. And if your training is like done together, it's not decentralized both of the agents? It's centralized training so agents can, I mean, they do have separate policies, but they can communicate during, okay. um, they can pass signal during training. That makes sense. Uh -huh. um, okay, so we want to build up on that. So we're gonna use that objective as part of our algorithm. So we're gonna build upon that work. Um, but the first thing that we do is uh, um, analyze theoretically how the objective function for the communication gain changes using um, this maximization over equivalence classes. So, um, so typically for, uh, for a signaling game, you would be maximizing um, your log, your, the, the probability of, um, so P of, P sub pi of G given G is the probability under the particular joint policy pi that the receiver will predict G given that the sender was communicating G. So that, that, that basically the sender and receiver agree. That's when you have communication success. So what we're adding here is um, uh, typically it's not costly communication. So we're adding some cost for the joint policy, which is coming from actions being taken, and also looking at some expectation over equivalence classes. So it would have already been an expectation over goals, but now we're looking at an expectation over equivalence classes as well. So how does that change the, the overall objective? Because those are two significant things. So the green is what changes from the previous line. Um, so I'm just expanding uh, the left, I'm just expanding each one of these on the left side is just like the log probability for each individual goal times it's prior and on the right side, C of A is the cost of the, um, a particular action times um, the probability of taking that action by the sender times the prior for that goal. And we do that over, take an expectation over all the goals. Um, so now the next um, line, what I've, what I've done is effectively um, expanded what's inside of the summation. So um, looking at the log probability of the joint, of, um, with respect to the joint policy, really means looking at the um, probability of the receiver policy predicting G given some equivalence class over actions times the sender policy predicting A given the original goal. Um, and so what we wanted to do is uh, pull the summation out of the log because, you know, you can't really do anything with that. So we use Jensen's inequality to be able to pull this out. And now it puts a greater than or equal to, uh, sign on the outside. And then on the right side here, I'm just condensing notation and saying we're going to take some expectation um, over the actions, uh, over the cost of the actions taken, given the joint policy. Um, so... So now this separates into, I mean, so now we can actually separate what's inside of the log into two separate terms. And so on the left side, we have the log probability of this receiver policy. Um, we, on the right side, we are in the middle, we have the log probability of the sender policy. So we wanted to maximize the log likelihood effectively. And um, after a few steps, which I don't really show here, then you can show that effectively, um, there are, are a couple key things that I wanna highlight that this is optimizing for. Um, 
which is maximizing mutual information between goals and equivalence classes over actions and minimizing effort. So uh, in particular, maximizing mutual information, what that effectively tells us is, um, given the joint policy that you're learning, if you see, if the, if the agents see a particular goal, they should be able to, with high probability, predict what, e what equivalence class of actions has probability mass. So effectively, which equivalence class of actions maps to that particular goal. And, um, and with, if you see a, an action or an equivalence class of actions with high probability, being able to predict which goal uh, is being communicated. So, um, so this is, you know, a, an analysis to show that we started with this log probability, uh, you know, of the goal given the, the goal in the beginning. So this communication efficacy, but what it really is trying to optimize for is mutual information between goals and equivalence classes over actions. So how can we obtain these equivalence classes uh, mapping, mappings becomes the next question. Um, all right, so a key limitation in the, in the prior work is that they assume equivalence mappings of the symmetries are given, but um, this is a limiting assumption in practice. Um, and so what we introduce is an iterative algorithm that will automatically discover the symmetries. Um, so an overview of the algorithm is we're gonna initialize the set of equivalence mappings with only the identity mapping, so an action can map to itself or um, and then for each iteration until convergence, there's a protocol training step, which I'm going to go through the intuition for in the next slide, as, um, which is going to train a set of optimal joint policies given the current set of symmetries. So you assume that the current set of symmetries is correct and you train policies given that. And then the next step is going to update the set, the set of symmetries. And so this kind of iteration happens until the, the, the convergence. So now I'm going to it uh, visually um, give intuition for this. So protocol training. So as input for this step, it's going to get the current set of symmetry. So of course that, that's initialized to just the identity matrix. Um, and then it will initialize a set of joint policies. And then what it wants to return here is um, the some optimal set of joint policies that it's converged upon. Um, and then that is going to be given as input to, for the symmetry discovery step, which will take as input the set of goals, the set of optimal policies, joint policies um, tr uh, trained in the previous step, and then the set of symmetries, the current set of symmetries. Um, and so this is just kind of the high level. And so what it wants to output is effectively updating the set of symmetries and then pass that back in. So you see kind of this. So this is the high level structure. So I'm gonna fill this in a bit. So over M training episodes, um, your, the agents will play the signaling game uh, with the set of symmetries. And um, that is going to output some performance for each of the joint policies. So communication success, as well as like a cost. Uh, and then um, the objective function will be used to update the policies. And I say K samples here because you can sample from the set of symmetries multiple times. Uh, and then on the right side for every single goal, um, uh, what we're looking at is every single pair of, of policies, every single, so in particular, I have only sender policies up here. So you see pi one star. So all the, all it needs to look at in order to discover action symmetries are optimal sender policies. So given some communicative goal, if I have two different optimal sender policies, I and J, and they take two different actions for the same goal, then I can infer that those uh, actions are symmetric. Effectively, they can be used interchangeably. And then I want to infer some mapping between them. So this is nice because it infers in equivalence mappings from a learning perspective based upon observations and actions of, the, of optimal agents. It doesn't have to adhere to the formal mathematical definition of symmetry as defined by the DEC -COM DP. Um, so then what I wanna highlight now is what does it mean? Um, how do we actually infer the mapping? for the symmetries, and then how do we use that uh, in the game? So first, how do we infer the mapping? Um, so if I have two different actions, and they're just represented as one hot vectors, um, and I already know that they're, they're uh, I've already, I already know they're equivalent because two different optimal senders took them, then effectively I'm just trying to learn a transformation matrix. And so, um, as that's what my equivalence mapping is. So I'm trying to minimize, and so what we do is minimize the KL divergence between action AI and some transformation of AJ that will turn it into AI. And then, you know, once that is, once it converges upon some transformation matrix that gets added to the set of symmetries here. 
Um, so the implication here is that a, a, effectively AI and AJ, these two actions are in the same equivalence class. All right, so returning back to this, now how do we use that in the signaling game round? Um, so now I'm a, so the sender agent will sample some goal. Um, it, can, it takes an action. That action gets transformed by sampling one of the uh, symmetries in the set of symmetries. So the receiver agent actually sees um, a different action and then it makes some prediction. And so if the receiver agent made the correct prediction, then the sender learns that I can um, use AJ to um, communicate goal G and the receiver learns that AI, action AI means goal G. Uh, and you can imagine in a later, in a later episode of the game, the relationship gets reversed. And so now the sender updates and says, oh, actually I can also take AI, action AI to um, communicate goal G and the receiver updates its learning and says, oh, actually if I see AJ, that also means goal G. That makes sense. So this is how these, um, this is how it gets built up in the game. All right, so, um, so back to our, the, the domain that I showed you. So now what this algorithm will do is there, were, there are many different ways if you, you do self-play to um, converge on optimal um, joint policy under that objective. But when you use um, QED, which is, which is using the other play objective under the hood, then there's only one way to map goals to equivalence classes over actions. So um, recall that the objective function um, maximizes mutual information between goals and equivalence classes over actions. So here, what you notice is for each of these goals, like for goal zero, it only maps to uh, one action, but for like goal one, it's gonna map to an entire distribution over every action in the equivalence class. Um, so this is, so with high probability, if I know this goal, I know which, act, which equivalence class of actions has probability mass in the space. And then over here, for actions, what you notice is for each of the, I mean, we actually trained it such that every action only mapped to one goal. Um, you could look at multiple goals and then there's some disambiguation that needs to happen. But for each of these actions, the receiver policy will only map to, only one goal has probability mass. So this is kind of, this is what it looks like empirically for it to be maximizing this mutual information between goals and equivalence classes. And then there's only one way to do this. Um, so here is a bunch of self-play joint policies. There are many different ways to, map using the self-play objective, but only one way to learn optimal joint policy using a QED algorithm. So what we see is in both uh, algorithms are able to perform well with their training partner, but, um, but self-play performance degrades significantly with a novel partner at test time, even in this simple domain. Uh, whereas QED, it's it's effectively the same performance because since they're all learning, you know, to my analogy earlier, we're all learning the same language. So even if I'm seeing a new agent at test time, I can communicate successfully with it. Um, there is one uh, trade-off, which is, or one key trade-off here, which is about energy costs. Um, and because uh, QED is um, effectively learning a probability mass over the entire action space, including the costly actions, it's going to overall have more energy cost. Um, yes. So I think I have some time, so maybe I will um, go to my hidden slide. Do, do I do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Like a little less than 10 minutes, that's it. Oh, okay, great. So then let me go to, actually, I will have a bit of time to do some continuous. So I'm thinking about continuous. Hold on. Sorry. Okay. Um, so in the continuous channel setting, uh, which is also which we also um, which we also did uh, work on, and this was this is actually a, um, actually originally started the continuous channel setting, and then went to the discrete domain where we realized it was really hard to do this. <laughs> but um, so here now instead of um, instead of just this kind of matrix game kind of setup, now the sender is learning a policy network, the receiver is learning, or and the receiver, receiver is learning a discriminator network, and motion trajectories are being used as the messages. So this is, um, this is you know, uh, underexplored in the multi-agent communication, the message is in this high dimensional continuous state and action space, um, and then the energy values are also continuous. Uh, 
now. So as opposed to the discrete, so we actually computed the torque of the trajectories. And so it's a, um, so the message space becomes intractably large here. Um, and um, the method that we use here, so it's still an open question as to how to, um, to do uh, QED uh, with this high dimensional continuous setting. But what we did here is do some self play training plus some third party receiver training. Um, and then the question with the continuous setting is, is zero shot uh, uh, communication possible in the continuous setting? Um, so, uh, so you have this center policy. So again, um, a goal is sampled. The policy takes some observation. Um, and then, and the actual goal as input, and then compute, uh, um, and then outputs an action, and that happens over several different time steps. And now there's an entire trajectory, and so the receiver agent is going to observe the trajectory by the sender. Uh, I mean, you can imagine it could also take some other sensory input, although in this case it didn't, um, and then it makes some prediction G. And um, it's still the case that the shared return is a combination of communication efficacy and cost, but now the cost is actually this continuous torque um, computation. Um, yeah. So here you have each of these, um, this represents sender receiver pairs that a bunch of them are training in parallel, uh, training the actual initial protocol. And then, um, we freeze all of the sender agents, and then we separate them into a train set and a test set. And, um, and then we initialize this third party receiver agent that learns a best response to all of the training senders and then gets tested on the test sender. So the zero shot communication here is, uh, these. remember these agents all trained independently. So if it can uh, distill um, some kind of communication protocol from the different training senders, and then uh, perform well against that. Those at the, the other agents at test time. That's zero shot communication. Um, so, so again, okay. So uh, this plot, um, the vertical axis shows um, the beginning of training to the end of training. So it's a little bit counterintuitive because the training is on the y-axis, and then the x-axis is the actual energy cost. So there's only two. So um, uh, you know, we only had two communic communicative goals here. But what you'd want to see is over the course of uh, course of training that um, goal one will use less energy than goal two because it's the one that occurs. It's, it occurs about two thirds of two thirds of the time, and goal two occurs about one third of the time. So this is what we're seeing. And then at the end of protocol training, this Gaussian is basically a Gaussian over the energy cost at, at the 10,000 marks at the very bottom. Um, and so what we see is that this is, um, yeah, so this speaks to this idea again of like um, mutual information between uh, the goals and the um, actions. So effectively the Gaussians are completely separated, which means that, um, if I know what the goal is, so if it's the blue goal or the orange goal, then with very high probability, I can predict how much energy is being exerted, like where the actions lie in the energy space. And if I know the actual energy exertion with very high probability, I can predict the, the goal. And the class of actions here is any action that will exert this much energy. So um, the other thing is that they're pushed all the way to the left, which means it's minimizing cost. The Gaussians are as far left as they can go. So this is again, showing us that our objective function is doing what we expect. And, um, and it also means that zero shot communication is possible in principle if you can, if the agent can figure out that energy is this latent variable it should be optimizing for. Um, so here's like a visualization of, so they're, they look quite arbitrary um, because there's no data that's biasing them. But, um, but it was really cool to see that uh, given this, um, this prior that we used and this cost constraint that they could be completely separable in the space and, um, and uh, infer intent based upon that. Um, open challenges with the, with the continuous setting is that it's difficult inferring this latent energy variable um, for high dimensional trajectories. Performance degrades significantly as you increase the number of communicative goals because effectively it's a combinatorial search problem. So, um, and, um, and then discovering symmetries for the continuous channel is, is quite um, challenging. Um, okay, so 
Yeah. So the motivating goal here was the emergence of communication protocols that generalize. So we have these costly channels that effectively derive from energy exertion. And I did end up talking about the high dimensional continuous channels, which are motivated by the idea of embodied agents. Um, key contributions of the work is that we formally introduced a zero shot communication problem setting, incorporated realistic priors and, and cost constraints to induce bias. Um, theoretical analysis of the communication objective with equivalence classes and, and what that's optimizing for, uh, the QED method, and then exploring some optimization in the continuous action protocol uh, setting. Um, and then some open challenges. Um, so, um, so one set of things is um, for the zero shot communication protocols, still um, analyzing the sample complexity. Um, so it is um, quite computationally expensive. And, uh, you know, and this is even for the toy domain, we're doing QED. Uh, so understanding, you know, kind of uh, what implications that has and if we can bound that sample complexity is still something that's ongoing. Um, and then one of the things that I didn't show is that um, when we talk about, when I talk about like converging on optimal joint policies, I, that it's very sensitive to where the joint policies initialize in the space, which is probably not surprising to any of you, but um, effectively like one out of 10 times or something that it would actually converge on a globally optimal solution. So I was doing a lot more computation than ideal uh, because um, it was constantly falling prey to like locally optimal solutions. And I have some images of locally optimal solutions if you're interested, but, um, but this is, you know, a, a key challenge, um, robustly converging on the globally optimal protocol, um, because the entire idea of the zero shot, you know, communication is rest upon agents converging on the same protocol, so the same optimum. Um, if you want human compatible protocols, I mean, I did motivate this talk on a high level by humans a while back, um, then one has to start thinking about perhaps using a supervisory signal or other priors that um, can be exploited in order to make the, I mean, you saw how arbitrary the trajectories were. So if we want them to be compatible with humans, then uh, it needs to be biased towards, um, you know, the ways in which humans communicate. And um, another thing that I'm quite interested in these days is uh, mixed motive settings. So thinking about social dilemmas. And so, you know, this whole work has been set um, in a setting where it's fully cooperative. And so you as assume that agents incentives are already aligned. And now the key question becomes, how do you get them to efficiently and effectively coordinate and communication can aid in that. Um, also the case, if one thing I didn't list here is like going beyond referential games would also be uh, important for like actual more interesting coordination challenges. But um, another thing that I'm quite interested in is what about when you start to add not only this pro-sociality, which is, you know, when you'd have cooperation, but self-interest, which I think is more indicative of the kinds of, um, you know, of biological agents like humans. And uh, then we're looking at not just thinking about communication protocols, um, and information exchange for efficient coordination, which is effectively what you think about for, I mean, that's effectively the purpose of the communication protocol in a fully cooperative setting to aid in more efficient coordination. But when you get to the social dilemma setting, then this communication becomes a negotiation that's really about trying to align incentives to enable that cooperation. Um, so yeah, that's it. Awesome, thanks a lot. That was a really interesting work. Uh, let's see, does anyone have uh, questions? Oh yeah, Danny. Two questions. Um, this is just me, I think, not understanding enough. Uh, the non-convexity in your work so that there's, you don't, you don't have like a global optimum that's unique uh, or like, sorry, like a stationary point that's unique. Where does that exactly come from? Because when I looked at the object, when you look at the objective that you defined that seemed convex to me or concave rather but i guess maybe the costs are not i see concave. yeah no that's a good question um let me go back some um here it comes from the fact that uh, so these different these are different um so okay so the so remember i gave the example of like le waving my left hand with my right hand for example right for the goal of saying hi you can imagine or nodding, those will be three different, um, given that there are different ways of communicating the same thing, like different actions that effectively are equivalent, 
you could, the, the two agents could converge on any of those protocols. So we could decide that to say, hi, we're always gonna, the most efficient thing to do is not to do some distribution over different ways because then there's uncertainty. The most efficient thing to do is learn deterministic protocol. So you, we always wave at our right hand to say hi. But then if I am communicating with someone else then or two other agents that are converging on a protocol might always wave their left hand, et cetera. So these, are, these represent um, different joint policies that are equivalent. Um, and so the problem is that um, with self-play, um, the assumption of basically I adapt to only my partner, my training partner, so we converge on one of these and that's fine. Um, but this is where the non-convexity is coming from, the different ways of it. But then, um, oh, but then uh, the, but the, the challenge is that if I'm facing a different pi, pi two at test time, let's say pi two prime, so a different person in the room, that person may have learned a protocol where they wave their left hand, which means they converged on a different so what we want is only one option. So everybody is learning to do it with their left hand. And then that way I see you and we're, we're doing the same thing. That makes sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then have you also considered like models where you have multiple centers and multiple receivers uh, and they have to maybe coordinate amongst each other? Like, how would you generalize this? Do you have any ideas? Yeah, basically, um, yeah, actually, I, I started with doing experiments with that um, in the continuous setting. There's lots of things that we try in the continuous setting. But basically, each sender uh, learns a best response to all the different receivers. And uh, so effectively, you can imagine, basically, at training time, you're sampling. If I'm a sender, the different receivers are being sampled over the course of many different episodes. I would have seen many different receivers, and my, I'm updating my policy as a response to all of the, and then same for the receivers. But you still, but then when you go to zero shot, the problem is you still want independently trained, which means a different population of senders and receivers. So you still have the same problem, which is why we ended up coming to just the single sender receiver case because it didn't, if it didn't add any value to have like ten, you know, a population of twenty or ten receivers and ten senders or something like this. Well, oh yeah, let's see over here. Thanks for the talk, really cool stuff. Um, can you say a little bit more about what you did for policy search? Would you just run like a dozen um, optimization algorithms from different initial points and hope that one of them found the global optimum? Yes, basically. Okay. <laughs> yeah, different initialization. So I mean like a smart, so I mean, you know, things that I have thought about and had conversations around like a smarter initialization um, would be one thing that could be helpful. A, um, 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 a better exploration uh, policy because it was just um, like entropy or uh, so it was pretty, pretty naive um, in terms of the, uh, so both of those might be helpful in terms of um, converging to a better, uh, a better. Uh, uh, do you have policy. any way of certifying whether you're at a global optimum or not? Or do you just, after you've run all 12, hope that you've found the best? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I currently know. Uh, so basically what we did is take the top, uh, I mean, so empirically what I noticed is, is about 10, I mean, at least 10% of the time it was converging on the global optimum. So we scored them and then it just took the top 10% uh, mm -hmm. and then assumed that that should, and typically that worked okay. Okay. But it, it feels hacky. Um, I mean, it's, it's fine. I mean, I guess it's not hacky, but it, it feels like not, that's not an ideal way to, to deal with it. Uh, it feels like QED is pretty brittle to this too. So it's it's important to get right. Yeah, I mean, and, and to be fair, this is a, a bigger problem in optimization when you have you know neural networks. And so it's not like it's just this, but it's very sensitive to converging on a global optimum. So even though this problem is a larger problem that's not unique to QED, it's one that, like you said, the QED is quite, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, yeah, so I had a question about when you discover the symmetries, how do you ensure that the senders not like collapse into just one mode? I don't know if that was clear. Um, so in like, in your training loop, you are first uh, training some agents, then you're basically, uh, I guess, computing the symmetries that they discovered, and then using that to train again. But what if they all collapse to the same protocol just at the beginning? Oh, I mean, oh, I see. So basically, this is where the number of, so you, you, you see these in joint policies, uh, because effectively what you want is diversity across the joint policies. So 
Um, this is where it's important to, I mean, empirically, we try different numbers. Like if you only have like two joint policies that you're training, then it's more likely the case that you're not gonna get sufficient diversity to be able to discover all the symmetries. So having a, a high number of those is one way to, to get closer to that. But I mean, ideally something that from an algorithmic perspective, if you had, um, a, if you added a part of the algorithm that would again, do better in terms of exploration or do a, a smarter, like a more informed exploration or like maximizing diversity across the different, um, across the different uh, you know, joint policies that are being trained, then you would be more confident that the different senders will be learning different ways of communicating the same goals. And so you should be able to discover those symmetries um, or you should be able to discover all the symmetries that exist. Okay. Because uh -huh. um, I guess my intuition would be that it doesn't always converge to the global optimal because it collapses at some point and you don't discover all the, the symmetries. Do you think it would be possible that it's related to that? Uh, I think that it has to do with uh, two things. I mean, so the initialization, but also it's a multi-objective optimization problem. So it's trying to, it's trying to um, optimize between communication accuracy or prediction accuracy and cost. And so it's not entirely clear. Uh, I mean, if I've done, when I watch the optimization, for example, it's not entirely clear how to best do that at what point. I mean, it, it starts, for example, by trying to like, drive down costs. Then at some point it starts optimizing for communication accuracy. I mean, this is what I would see empirically. But if you haven't, if you haven't driven down costs enough, then you're, you may be near uh, a locally optimal communication protocol. And so then when it starts trying to optimize for um, communication success, it converges on a, a communication protocol that's locally optimal. So I think, so basically a lot of the challenge has to do with the fact that it is also a multi-objective optimization that it's doing. And, um, and we tried like maybe having a curriculum over the different objectives. And um, so we, we tried playing with a few things, but I think that is a key issue. Okay, thanks a lot. Hi. So, Hi. yeah, maybe again with the issue of that it, that it converges to the global optimum like one out of ten times. Like you you were talking for future work, maybe biasing the agents towards more like human uh, like biases. Would this help guiding them? Not necessarily towards the global optimum, but at least like to a pretty good, um, like say let's say local optimum. Would 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 you have any intuition on that or? Yeah, I mean, so to be fair, I have been talking about uh, optimality and converging on some globally optimal solution, and maybe that affects my own bias, but the reality of it is they just need to converge on the same solution. It doesn't, I mean, even if it were suboptimal, if it were the same, then we could communicate. Yeah. So um, so it could be the case that if you have, now if you have human data, then that's biasing them, and maybe it forms a stronger bias, mm -hmm. and then they converge near that, yeah. and then, yeah. yeah. So, um, but then of course, that's a, that's a slightly different uh, way to approach the problem because now you're using data to bias as opposed to like going with strict, like strictly like um, optimization. Yeah. But, but I, I, I do believe that that is a different approach that could be, um, you know, quite helpful for. Yeah, you know, I was yeah. maybe thinking in a practical sense, like this is the keenest yeah. version of the problem. Of yeah. Course. yeah, yeah, and particularly with the continuous ones, I think you. Yeah. Okay, I, okay, I definitely think you need data there because then with the continuous ones, the trajectory space is so large, right? So mm -hmm. then, if you knew if you had human demonstrations, then you would prune the trajectory space significantly, and you'd know that like, oh, really, only like wiggling my toe is not actually an, yeah. a trajectory I should consider, right? Yeah. Like yeah. only this and you know, so some some trajectories near these spaces so i think for the discrete domain uh it wasn't as important to think about this data and and really dive into like the interesting problems around the difference between self-play and mm -hmm. but for a continuous domain you know thinking about robots or something and also for like safety reasons and whatever else i think yeah. data becomes probably much more important yeah and also like you talked about theoretical sample complexity but in practice, because the agents need to learn these equivalent mappings, how much longer does it take, like compared to just the regular self-play? You... Oh, it takes significantly longer. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's which is why I would like to understand. Uh, I mean, I, for me, like seeing the abstraction would help me to get um, a better idea of 
what that means, but um, I'm trying to look at this to tell you where, <laughs> where that comes in. Um, you know, yeah, let's talk about that offline because I yeah, feel like sure, I, have to, yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen this work in a little while. So I, I yeah. haven't really uh, uh, been diving into it since I've been a deep mind to be so. I have to remember where it was, but it, yeah, but uh, adding the symmetry discovery is, is quite expensive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Let's take one more question. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so one thing that I really like about, about um, QED is that it gives you the symmetries kind of like for free. Um, and then especially in the example you gave with the hand waving, I kind of think of these symmetries as like messages that have similar semantic meaning. And so maybe not in this setting where, where the game is like referential and kind of like single round, but I was wondering if you could um, lift these symmetries to translate the messages that the agents are communicating. So for example, in the uh, Mordach and Abiel work that you had, a few slides back, they have this like compositional language and a much more like embodied environment and so on. Um, and then they just like hand translate the messages to give the reader some intuition, but like getting an automatic translation for these things would be really cool. So you could, I was wondering if you had thought about taking this in the like translation direction or what do you mm -hmm. think some pitfalls of using the symmetries for that might be? Oh uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So I haven't thought about it, um, but I do. I think that if you have, if you if you have data which is going to give rise to semantic meaningfulness, then like human data, then I think then it might be then it might be the case that you could look at some distance between trajectories that the agent that the agents are converging upon and like trajectories that you have in your data set and try to understand like semantically what this you know is close to or um, I mean all of it, I mean also even if you didn't have even if you didn't have a, a like some distance metric, you know, um, or even if you didn't have like a data set where you could do a distance metric, uh, I think you know looking at the trajectories is oftentimes meaningful because they are trying to minimize energy, so you can see you know how mapping to some goal that occurs really frequently should be uh, much less motion and, and less velocity than um, a goal that occurs with much less frequency. Mm -hmm. But particularly for like goals that occur with much less frequency, they can have arbitrarily very weird trajectories and 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 it's hard to make sense of them. So I think I think data would be a key aspect there. And then it could be interesting to to see if there's something meaningful. Like kind of like you know what a lot of the emergent communication people do from a language perspective when they're trying to discover some kind of sy syntactic structure or something like this. Yeah. All right. When we uh, stop there, uh, let's uh, thank Alicia again. That was uh, yeah. I mean. I think a really thought-provoking talk. Yeah. Great, so let's uh, come back uh, at 10.15 for the next talk, okay? Cool.